Hey, what's up, everybody? And thank you for listening to Operation Agency Freedom, where we are bringing you top secret advice from the world's most badass digital agency owners, influencers, and now our very first software owner. Uh, these amazing men and women are sharing their stories of how they have built six, seven, and eight figure digital agencies and how you can too. My name is Chris Martinez, CEO of Dude, where we help digital agencies by giving them the people and the processes so they can take on more projects and scale profitably. And today I am joined by my friend, the very successful Chris Ronzio, founder and CEO of Trainual. What's up, Chris? It's only been like a week since we talked. <laughs> I know. Thanks for having me. Dude. I, I bet everybody says, what's up, dude? But it, I, I, I feel like I want to say that. What's up? What's up, dude? What's up, man? You can say whatever you want. You can say dude, man, bro, guy. Chris. Chris and Chris this episode. Amigo. Exactly. This is the Chris and Chris show. Um, so, you know, we start off every show with a little roundtable discussion, and I am very excited to talk about this one particularly. I had to, we had to peel back the layers of your life and to, to find this one. So you were on the show Total Request Live on MTV, yes, TRL, with Carson Daly. So tell us about that experience. For those oh, that man. are like under 25, they probably have no idea what the heck we're talking about, but. For yeah, those, like, it's funny. Older. Yeah, so. So I grew up in Boston and my wife and I, she was my girlfriend at the time, we always used to get on a train and, and go from Boston down to New York for little day trips. And so um, we, one day we waited in line to, we saw that TRL was filming and you go to Times Square and you see the MTV studios mm -hmm. and there was a line around the corner. And so we're like, what is that line? And they told us it was for the show. Like we could actually be on the show. No way. So waited in line and, and uh, saw the live, live audience. And I actually got, uh, I was on the, the the show requesting some Gwen Stefani song because they they tell you what to request. They're like they're like, hey man, do you, you like here's the mic, here's what you got to say. And so I had to request this like, uh, you know the the song where she's like, B bananas, be oh yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so so all all of my like college roommates and stuff were like, dude, what's your problem? Why like what are you requesting a exactly. Gwen Stefani? But that's what happens behind the scenes. That's hilarious. You know, so like I went to school in Santa Barbara, which is near LA. Um, I'm from LA originally. And so what we would do is we would, uh, freshman year, everybody would get together with their, their floor and you would drive down and you would watch The Price is Right. Because they had a deal where like if you went with a big enough group, then um, you were guaranteed to get, you know, seats to watch the show. And then somebody in your party would be guaranteed to be a contestant. Nice. So literally like every week there was a pack of, you know, people from UC Santa Barbara, like going down to watch the prices. Right. But like being on the East coast, uh, you know, it would have been nearly impossible for us to be on TRL. And I think I'm a little bit older than you too. So like that show started when I was, uh, I think a freshman in, in college. And wow. it was like the biggest show on earth. Like everybody <laughs> would watch. This is back when MTV still had music videos. Right. Uh, and people still had KB, cable TV, you know, because now nobody I know the, the only reality TV, it seemed like, was that, that show and was was like, you know, the the uh, summer break kind of things that they mm -hmm. had where they would do stupid contests. I remember being like, I think I was in middle school and went to San Diego when they were filming at this beach house in San uh -huh. Diego. Mandy Moore's standing on the beach and I was like so excited. And so I'm trying to get in the camera shot and I walk up behind her and this huge wave comes and takes me down. I didn't realize that I was like at the waves, the shore is coming in. And so I fell down in the water on, uh, you know, on in, behind Mandy Moore. So I wish I had that clip. That's awesome. So, you know, um, when the TRL set, cause this is what I'm always like surprised by is like on TV, the sets look huge. And then at least when I went, because I, when I was a kid, I remember we went and saw American Gladiators, if you remember that show. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a, one of my friends for like his birthday, we were like eight or nine years old. His dad took us to go watch a ta taping of American Gladiators, which was like amazing. And on TV, it looks massive. And then you get there and it looks like way smaller. And same with Price is Right. Like Price is Right looked huge on TV. And then you get there and it's like pretty small. Like you can only fit maybe... I don't know, 25 people across the rows. So it was not very yeah, good. Yeah, totally. Same thing with TRL. It's like they've got these little sets, you know, the curvy uh, stage that you yep. sit on and they yep. just file like 40 people in there to make it look full and, and that's it. I remember I had a friend that worked at ESPN and he took me to uh, to sport the set of Sports Center, and I sat at the Sports Center desk and same thing, like you, it's, it's like as big as my, my home office here. But right. It just looks big on TV. 
That's amazing. And, and yeah. so like, you know, that must've been also cool for you. Cause like at the time you had the video business. So being able to see that, or were you kind of like used to that already? No, it was the video stuff I did was like filming cheerleading events and, you know, <laughs> like real amateur video. So the big studio stuff was, was really impressive. Did you like geek out on the equipment that they were using? And like, you're like telling your girlfriend like, oh my God, that mic's yeah. like $50,000. <laughs> yeah, totally. She's rolling her eyes and I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> Look at that lens. The lens on the camera is 30 grand. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. But now, I mean, nowadays, you know, the, the same quality equipment that they used for like, you know, primetime shows, I mean, you got to be able to get that at a tenth of the price. Totally. I mean, like even the, the, I have this little drone that I fly mm -hmm. around, to, you know, the neighborhood and stuff. And the quality on that little drone is better than when I have my video business, we hired this guy at MIT who built a six foot by six foot helicopter that could fly around holding a five pound camera. And the, the, like, how expensive that thing was and how much time went into that. And now for 500 bucks, you get this little drone that shoots in 5k. It's crazy. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, enough talk about TRL. Let's, let's get into, you know, what it is that you, that you do now. And, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we always have agency owners on. Um, and you're the, the first person who has, uh, technically now you're running a software company. Um, but you do have experience as an agency owner, which is really, really interesting as well. So why don't we start off, you know, tell us about your entrepreneurial history and how you got started at a very, very young age with your video business. Yeah, so I started the video company when I was 14 and it was, I was in high school, uh, there was a film department, so I was always in there making videos and a friend and I had this show that ran on the cable access station in town. Oh, dude, that's awesome. And so, yeah, it's like it's Wayne's so World. <laughs> so it was exactly like that. And so, and so people at the time I worked at the grocery store with my friend, we bagged groceries and people would recognize us in the store because our episodes were all that would air on this cable station, like 50, 60 times a week. And people would be like, Oh, you're the video guy. And so one time someone asked like, can you film my, my grandpa's 80th birthday? And so we scrambled, borrowed the camera from the school and charged, you know, $200 to film a birthday party that turned into weddings and music videos and bar mitzvahs and kind of anything for anyone. But the big break was a, about a year later when the school asked us to film this statewide cheerleading championship. And so it, it seemed like a, an easy gig for, for, you know, come film cheerleaders. I was pretty excited, but we ended up making like a thousand dollars in VHS tape sales by just wow. setting up a camera and selling copies to parents that were coming to this event. So that became the whole business. We did cheerleading, we did dance, we did figure skating, we did uh, equestrian, like horse, horse jumping shows. We did mm. swimming, synchronized swimming. And so we'd partner with these events and we would send a camera operator. And then through the, the evolution of the business, we went from taking orders and shipping out VHS tapes to handing out you know, USB sticks, the flash drives with the, the video on it, to then on demand and live streaming and all that. Dude, that's amazing. So, um, first of all, my first question is, what was the name of your show when you were 14? And what the <laughs> heck did you guys shoot? Like, what did you guys talk about? Man, back to the beginning. It, it was called Talk Back. So, it was, Jay Leno used to have this segment called Talk Back. And it was, we had the show before he had the segment. And I remember okay. getting so mad when that came out because it was basically the same thing. Like we interviewed people on the street and asked them silly questions. Like, do you know who the- Oh yeah, you of know, course. I love that one. Yeah. Yeah. What's the logo on the Starbucks cup and people don't know what it is. And, and so it was just one of those kind of interview shows. Awesome. Okay, cool. So I'll, yeah, I could see how you could easily become famous from that. Um, and it's funny because people freeze up when they see a camera, like they're normal, smart people. And you put a camera and a microphone in their face and they're like, uh, <laughs> so totally. it, really, was the really red, it was answer. the red light. The camera started having the setting where you can turn off the red light. So oh, okay. that you'd talk to people and be like, oh yeah, we already recorded it. No problem. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Cool. Okay. So um, then when it comes to like the training, like, did you have any other formal training outside of what you were learning, like in the classroom? Training for business training, you mean? For the, no, I'm sorry, for the videographer, like for doing video, for shooting the, the video and making sure that you have good angles and good lighting and like all that good stuff. 
Yeah, it, it really came from my high school department and from the cable access station. There was this guy at the, the station who ran all the programming, you know, the town hall meetings mm -hmm. and our show. And he was a huge mentor for me in the first few years of high school. Um, so he taught us how to use the cameras, how to set up sets and how to light and how to clip on a lavalier mic and how to edit with the first computer programs when, you know, Avid was like the first editing thing. Right. Um, so, so he was a, a, a big mentor. And then, um, and then I, by the time I was out of college, I was more on the business side of the business than the video side of the business. So mm -hmm. it was a pretty clear divide. Awesome. Okay. So you ran the video company until what year approximately? 2013. Okay, cool. Um, and then what was the next step? Like how, how, what, there was a couple things in between and then before you started train you all, right? Uh, yeah. So when I was the, the very end of the video company, we were doing events in all 50 states. We had over 300 camera operators. We were dispatching to different different events. And I had really fallen out of love with the video stuff. You know, I, I really liked building the systems for our business. And so the systems for finding and hiring and training camera operators, I really liked. And the systems for sending out our, our you know, our production kits with the SOPs and checklists, like I loved that. And once that was dialed in, I felt kind of like, ah, oh, I don't want to book more events. And so I had my operations manager uh, prom promoted him into president of the company. And over about six months, he took over all the day to day and I got totally out of the business. And so for the next year, I started doing consulting just for friends of mine, people that you know wanted software tools set up in their company and need some outside perspective. And I really time shared it across like five companies where I'd spend a day at each company and clock in and out at, at five different businesses. And as I was doing that, I was loving it because it was all different industries. I was seeing different problems. It was getting me excited. And I, I really didn't want to think about the video business anymore. So that was where a year later I sold the video business and then formalized the consulting I was doing and built a consulting agency. Awesome. And, and I think that that's one of your, I mean, you would probably agree, but that's got to be one of your superpowers. And I think that's something that I also... Like kind of like one of my superpowers is the, the process side, which a lot of people hate. Like a lot of entrepreneurs, they love to sell, you know, they love to market, they love doing the creative stuff. Not a whole lot of like operations minded people or people who enjoy like putting those processes together. Yeah, it's, it feels like two sides of a coin. Like it's hard to be both. And so for so long, I told myself, I was the operations guy yeah. and I, I relied on other people and personalities to be the sales and the marketing. And, and I was just totally content setting up a project management system and building yeah. out like a thousand item checklist. Right. Well, I mean, all of those skills come together, right? Cause you started Trainual, was it like three or four years ago? Uh, a little over two years ago. So two years very ago, beginning, okay. uh, yeah, 2018. Okay. So you, you get this, uh, where did you get the idea for Trainual from? And, uh, and of course, tell us what Trainual does. Yeah, yeah. So, so when I was consulting, it was businesses that were five to 50 employees. That was the sweet spot. Okay. And I, I would see all different problems at the companies, but the most recurring problem was a inconsistency between who did what, or, or you know, they'd have uh, incorrect expectations for an employee. The employee didn't totally understand what their role was, or they had grown into a different role since they were hired. And the, there, there had been something broken as they handed processes off. And so through this, I heard so many times, you know, companies should have standard operating procedures and an operations manual. And that feels like a low that unless you're a big business, you wouldn't have the bandwidth and the time to do that. Yeah. And so I started doing that for, for clients as a, pro as a project. It would just be Word docs and, and Google docs. And as I would consult with them, I'd have to create training for here's, you know, here's this system. We just set up this new tool. Now here's the training for all the employees on how, what they do now. Yeah. And so as I was doing that, I thought, man, there's, there should be a better system like an intranet or a, like some easy tool that small businesses can use. And I was annoyed that I couldn't do one. Like it, it was in the, in, you know, years ago, it was like WordPress plugins and you had to basically be an engineer to, to cobble something together. Right. And so Trainual was a prototype that I built for clients. I had a, a couple freelance developers in my town and they built this little tool with me and then I just used it with my existing clients. And, and for me, it was like I ha had some IP to go along with my consulting services. Right. So it wasn't until a few years later that we made it a business. 
And so you would essentially take your consulting clients and then set them up with an account uh, in your trainual, pre-trainual software, and then they would run mm -hmm. all of their training programs off of you. And then that also helped you with retention. Yeah. So, so, well, it wasn't necessarily retention. It was like, they, it, they would hire me, whatever it was, you know, a 5,000 or 15,000 or 20,000 for a project where I'd come in for a day or a week or a couple months and optimize their systems. And then this was sort of the handoff. It mm -hmm. was like, once, once they've done that work, let me put it somewhere so that now you can have it as a clean package. And so I wasn't charging for it at first. And then a couple years into it, I started uh, charging like $49 a month. And I thought, okay, as I work with more companies, this will be like a really good little, little stream Additional of revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So then at what point did you realize, you know what, man, I should just, just do this trainual thing full time. <laughs> <laughs> so this was late 2017 and kind of a couple things happened. Like the, the first thing was we had like, we hit 25 customers that were paying for the tool. And okay. so the, the revenue stream was close to $2,000 and it covered my mortgage at that time. And I remember having this like dinner with my wife and saying, wow, I can't believe that this little thing that I haven't told anybody about is covering our, our mortgage payment. Like this, this is something she's like, yeah, you should focus on that. So she had been saying that the, the last couple of years. And then the other thing that happened was we had built the consulting business to had five employees, like seven figure business. And we were covering all of its expenses with about 70% of our capacity. So I thought, why don't we, instead of getting another couple of clients, we wrapped up a, pro a couple of projects. I said, instead of replacing them, why don't we rebuild this tool? Let's put all of our extra capacity into rebuilding a version two of Trainual. And mm -hmm. so it was over a few months that I was putting all these ideas into it and like got so passionate. It was the only thing I was working on. And um, I, I, I realized I had this, this, this idea or epiphany that um, instead of charging for time, instead of charging for the consulting time, what if I took all of our resources, all of our experience of working with 150 businesses and all the tools and SOPs and everything we built, what if we flip that into marketing content and just give expertise, but then we monetize it with the software and say, you know, every business should have a playbook. Here's a cheap tool to, to build yours. And so I, I got everybody in a room and we talked about this pivot and he said, you know, can we, can we do this like cold Turkey, turn down all the consulting work, try to make a SaaS company. And everybody was on board because we knew we could always go back to consulting. So right. it was January, 2018 that we made the move. Wow. So, um, you know, you had built a software platform for yourself, but did you have any idea what capacity like you could run at, without making major modifications to the software and like making all these huge enhancements? Like how scalable was it? Or? Yeah, exactly. Like yeah, you're going to no, put 20 it, people on it. It's one thing, <laughs> you know, 200 people is like a different thing. And 2000 is way different. No, I had no idea. And even my, my developer had no idea. You know, he was a pretty, pretty junior developer. And when we initially built it out, I was like, okay, if we have, you know, we, we've got 25 people on it and I know what that costs. What if we had, you know, like 2,500 people on it, what would be the server costs and all this? Yeah. And he was like, looking back, he was so off. He was way <laughs> off in what he was getting, you know, we had, we had no idea. And so it took, you know, uh, a lot, it's taken a lot of building in the last couple of years to stabilize the product, refactor the code, do all this stuff. But in the early days, it was like, we weren't going to over invest if we couldn't prove some traction. And so right. it was all about how do we sign up the first hundred customers? Okay. So, and I, I think that, that a lot of people can relate to that too, even if they're not running a software agency, if just a, a business in general, it's like, you know, the first benchmark is maybe a revenue target, 10 grand a month or a, a client target, hundred clients, 50 clients, whatever that is. So what was your plan to get to that first hundred users? So initially we, my, my plan was, let me tell everyone I know. And I optimistically thought, well, everyone's going to sign up. So that'll, <laughs> <laughs> that, there we go. That didn't happen. So it was crazy to me because I had gone from selling these 10 or $20,000 consulting projects to, I couldn't sell for the life of me a $49 subscription. And I'd get on, you know, a call with a CEO 
that I that had bought consulting from me and I'm like yep it's $49 a month we'll charge your credit card and he'd be like well let me let's schedule another call and let me, let me loop in a few it. other people and I don't know how hard so I, I would I would caution anyone that thinks it's going to be easy you know it's when you're when you're doing a, an agency and doing the work for people that's pretty tangible they know they're going to get the work done when they feel like they have to do the work it's a totally different thing so the plan for the first hundred was first tell everyone that didn't work. We had a party, uh, invited everybody, and through this happy hour, invited uh, you know uh, the press and stuff like that to get some photos and and record some videos. That was cool. Created a little buzz. Then we launched on Product Hunt, so we got some exposure there. Uh, Product Hunt's a website where there's like beta apps and stuff. Okay. Um, and then we. And then we, uh, three months in, we started our Facebook ads. And that was the first traffic that was coming in that was really cold traffic, not referral traffic. Um, and then there were, there were other things that we did, like, you know, I downloaded the list of every contact on LinkedIn and spammed 3,000 people. Nice. <laughs> and, and I think I think at the beginning, you know, you've got to hustle for the first yeah. 50, 100 customers. Um, and we got there, you know, it took, it took six months to get to a hundred customers. Um, but we got there, we hit that 10 K MRR mark. And from there, the growth was all about our ads. Okay, cool. So, um, like at this point, who is on your team, uh, in the different roles to help you get this thing up, you know, to get to a hundred and beyond. Yeah. So it was me, my developer, our, we had hired a UX uh, designer mm -hmm. and sh she was part of the consulting firm and worked with our clients on workflows and user experience. So was, was, um, you know, mostly doing wireframes, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, like a project manager. She started as my assistant, became project manager. Then she uh, adapted into customer success and sales. And now she's, she, she was employee number one. So she's our uh, chief of staff now. Uh, and then, uh, and then my brother did our, did our marketing. So he, he joined the team as soon as we launched Trainual. Awesome. Okay. So you get to the hundred, hundred users, uh, Mark, um, what's the next target after that? 200 or well, after, after a hundred, I mean that, that put us to that sort of, we had passed the, the hundred K ARR, you know, in, in a yeah. software business, you're tracking probably similar to agency retainers. You're, you're, you're looking at your monthly recurring and your annual recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. And so we, we passed the, the hundred K ARR and then we passed the 10 K MRR mm -hmm. and the next milestone was 500 K ARR. So it was whatever, 43, 43 a month, something like that. And, uh, and so that we hit in October of, of the first year, 2018. And then, and then after that, it was the million dollar mark that we were chasing. Perfect. Um, were there any significant <clears throat> hurdles that you had to overcome that you didn't anticipate as you were getting from, let's just say 10 K a month to 50 K a month? Yes. Lots of them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the product broke so many times. I mean, technically we didn't know what we were doing. So we really, you know, we're fortunate to have uh, patient customers and people that were really getting value out of the tool because we would do something stupid, like update the, update the sign up form. And then, a week later, we'd have no signups and wonder what happened. And it was because it was totally broken on mobile. You know, like the, the, <laughs> we didn't, we, we didn't have a, a QA process. And so if I were to go back, I'd, I'd probably want at least someone to consult me on the things I should be aware of, you know, like the, like right. maybe a checklist or something. Um, so that, that was a learning lesson. The, our dependence on Facebook ads was a huge part of how we grew to that 50K MRR mark. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge code to crack. So the, the understanding of like how to do a funnel and how, what kind of ad catches the cold traffic the best and what sort of interest-based targeting or lookalike audiences you should use and what's the content and the copywriting need to say. Like it was like every day was a new lesson. We were just endlessly consuming podcasts and YouTube videos and trying to figure this stuff out. 
and we were looking at review sites and on case studies and figuring what are customers talking about? What are they complaining about? How do we take that language and turn it into ads? And, uh, and then how much should we spend on our ads? And so we got a tip where friend said that, you know, when, when you've got an ad that's working, we, you should ramp it up 30% every three days was the, the tip that he gave us. Wow. And so, and so we went from spending like uh, $4,000 a month in, in the spring to thirty-five dollars or $40,000 a month by the end of the summer um, because we were you know, running ads and they were working. They were converting. People were signing up. Uh, two months later, they hadn't canceled yet. So we're starting to loosely put together this, this, uh, this, this funnel and understand lifetime value. That was a huge learning curve. And then I think um, sales was the, the next big thing. We hired our first sales rep in October of that year. Mm -hmm. And really, we needed someone that could be a catch-all for all of the opportunities that were surfacing because there was partner opportunities and affiliate opportunities and people talking joint ventures and, and integrations and, and these big, you know, franchises that want to use it but have a six month sales cycle so you got to keep the conversation going right. um so many lessons it's, it's hard to separate them yeah all right so um you know what's the future hold for you guys because you know last year i think it was last year when you guys got uh, a big round of funding which was great mm -hmm. give you a little you know boost to help you grow faster what's the future hold for train Yule? So yeah, we, we closed a series A in November of last year. So we're four, about four and a half months in from doing that. Um, the, I think the unique thing about raising funds and something I recommend to people is we were able to build our MRR to the point that it entirely covered our operating expenses so that the only money we would burn through in a month would be a surplus of ad spend that we could dial back if needed. And it put us in a really great spot because a lot of companies are operationally kind of upside down they're burning through money just because they have a high overhead mm -hmm. and i think if you can if you can build a business that pays for itself in any given month and you control the lever of advertising and you control how much you want to burn then it puts you in a real strong position so we were fortunate to do that we raised the series a mainly to help with three things. Um, one was we had never, we had one customer success rep and 3000 customers. And, and so Definitely it, need another was, one, another few of those ones. Yeah. So that was one thing that, you know, we were, we were so focused on getting new customers that we weren't being proactive in developing relationships and enhancing the value people got from the tool. And so now we've got six CS reps like four and a half months later. Um, so that, that was the big thing. The, the next thing was, uh, the product. So we are building out squads. We went from kind of a one team approach to a few, a few team approach, mm -hmm. um, to, to more efficiently tackle the roadmap and build some more advanced tools. So where, where we're taking the product is to be a better tool for companies that have never documented anything. Whereas when we launched, it was a great accountability tool where if you had stuff, you could put it in there, you could build it out. If you were like me and you, you could jump in there and just- oh, I built out a training in like a weekend. Like it yeah, was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and, there's, and for sure, there's people that do that. But if you're, if you're not the process kind of person, and we're building yeah. tools to make that way easier. So awesome. Um, so that's a big thing. Uh, and then just the, the the marketing, you know, to to get to where we got to is all about acquisition. But now we're starting to have to invest more in brand to be a kind of a category leader. And there's a, a lot more diversity in what you have to do there. Gotcha. Well, dude, you know, like I've, we've been using the, the software for got to be at least a year. Um, and I mean, we love it. We think it's fantastic tool. Um, you know, we do have a development team. So technically we probably could have built something ourselves, but just why? I mean, like, why would I waste my, the time and resources of my, my staff who are working on our client projects? Um, and so, you know, that's literally, I, I got the software and I was like, I need to create these trainings over the course of a weekend. So I was basically up, you know, working on this in my living room, which is coincidentally where I'm at now. Um, <laughs> for a different reason though, like literally like Friday night, uh, I just started banging these things out and I had a full on training. I can't remember which one it was. Um, but I had a full on training done basically within a uh, course of a weekend. So but keep in mind, awesome. like you said, I am yeah. the outlier. You're, we are the outliers where like this stuff comes pretty easy to us. 
Yeah, but, it's, um, you know, anybody that's got a step-by-step process and kind of knows what they want to communicate, but they need the the accountability of, you know, I need an easy way to distribute this to people and to track if they've done it and to update them if things changed. Like if, if all you really needed was the accountability, the tool would be great for you, you know, when it was a prototype. But right. now I think where, where we're getting to is we've got dozens and dozens of templates now and we're, we're doing like interview bot kind of tools and things that make it easier for people that don't know where to start. Yeah, that, dude, that's perfect. Awesome, man. Well, we're just about out of time. So um, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you or to check out Trainual? Yeah, just go to trainual.com. It's like training manual. So check that out. If you're reaching out to me, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram is kind of like behind the scenes and then a YouTube channel. Awesome, man. And who would be the perfect person to reach out to you today? perfect person would be an entrepreneur or a operations or HR leader of a, a growing company. So if it's an agency owner and whether you're hiring virtual people to join your team or you need to train your, your, even your customers, people train their customers on their processes. So anyone that's got something to get across to a large number of people should definitely check it out. Awesome, man. Well, Chris, thanks so much for being on the show. And to all of our listeners, make sure that you guys return next Thursday and every Thursday for the next episode of Operation Agency Freedom.